Hey, long time no see. Konnichiwa, minasan, konbanwa. How are you doing? Are you good? Are you Genki? This is Grey over at Wakazashi's Tea House. I want to read you a bedtime story. So if you've got time, just sit back, relax, put me on in the background, and I want to read from A Wild Sheep Chase by Haruki Murakami. The title of chapter 25 is Transit Completed at Movie Theatre on to the Dolphin Hotel. The entire flight, she sat by the window and looked down at the scenery. I sat next to her, reading my adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Not a single cloud in the sky, the whole time the airplane, riding on its shadow over the earth. Or, more accurately, since we were in the plane, our shadows figured as well inside the shadow of the airplane, skimming over mountain and field which would mean we too were imprinted into the earth. I really like that guy, she said, after drinking her orange juice. That guy who? The chauffeur. Hmm, I said, I liked him too. And what a great name, Kipper. For sure, a great name. The cat might be better off with him than he ever was with me. Not the cat, Kipper. Right. Kipper, why didn't you give the cat a name all that time? Why indeed, I puzzled. Then I lit up a cigarette with the sheep engraved lighter. I think I just don't like names. Basically, I can't see what's wrong with calling me, me, or you, you, or us, us, or them, them. Hmm, she said. I do like the word we, though. It has an Ice Age ring to it. Ice Age? Like we go south, or we hunt mammoths, or... When we stepped outside at Chitose Airport, the air was chillier than we'd expected. I pulled a denim shirt over my t-shirt, she a knit vest over her shirt. Autumn had come over the land one whole month ahead of Tokyo. We weren't supposed to run into an Ice Age, were we? she asked on the bus to Sapporo. You hunting mammoths, me raising children? Sounds positively inviting, I said. She soon fell asleep, leaving me gazing through the bus window at the endless procession of deep forest on both sides of the road. We hit a coffee shop, first thing on arriving in the city. Right off, let's set our prime directives, I said. We'll have to divide up, that is... I go after the scene in the photograph. You go after the sheep. That way we save time. Mm, very pragmatic, she said. If things go well, I amended. In any case, you can cover the major former sheep ranches of Hokkaido and study up on sheep breeds. You can probably find what you need at a government office or the local library. I like libraries, she said. I'm glad. Do I start right away? I looked at my watch. 3.30. Nah, it's already getting late. Let's start tomorrow. Today, we'll take it easy. Find a place to stay, have dinner, take a bath, and get some sleep. I wouldn't mind seeing a movie, she said. A movie? What with all that time we saved by flying? Good point, I said. So we popped into the first movie theatre that caught our eye. What we ended up seeing was a crime occult double feature. There was hardly a soul in the place. It had been ages since I'd been in a theatre that empty. I counted the people in the audience to pass the time. Eight, including ourselves. There were more characters in the films. The films were exemplars of the dreadful. The sort of films when you feel like turning around and walking out the instant the title comes on after the roaring MGM lion. Amazing that films like that exist. The first was the occult feature. The devil who lives in the dripping dank cellar of the town church and manipulates things through the weak preacher takes over the town. The real question, though, was why the devil wanted to take over the town to begin with. All it was was a miserable nothing of few blocks surrounded by cornfields. Nonetheless, 
The devil had this terrible obsession with the town and grew furious that one last little girl refused to fall under his spell. When the devil got mad, his body shook like quivering green jelly. Admittedly, there was something endearing about that rage. In front of us, a middle-aged man was snoring away like a foghorn. To the extreme right, there was some heavy petting in pro progress. Behind, someone let out a huge fart. Huge enough to stop the middle-aged man snoring for a moment. A pair of high school girls giggled. By reflex, I thought of Kipper. And it was only when I did that it came to me that we'd really left Tokyo and were now in Sapporo. Funny about that. Amid these thoughts, I fell asleep. In my dreams, I encountered that green devil, but he wasn't endearing in the least. He remained silent, and I just observed his machinations. Meanwhile, the film ended, the lights came on, and I woke up. Each member of the audience yawned, as if in predetermined order. I went to the snack bar and bought ice cream for us. It was hard as a rock, probably left over from last summer. You slept through the whole thing. Uh-huh, I said. How was it? Pretty interesting. In the end, the whole town explodes. Wow. The movie theatre was deathly quiet. Or rather, everything around us was deathly quiet. Not a common occurrence. Say, she said, doesn't it seem like your body's in a state of transit or something? Now that she mentioned it, it actually did. She held my hand. Let's just stay like this. I'm worried. Okay. Unless we stay like this, we might get transported somewhere else, someplace crazy. As the theatre interior grew dark again and the coming attractions began, I brushed her hair aside and kissed her ear. It's all right, don't worry. You're probably right, she said softly. I guess we should have ridden in transportation with names, after all. For the next hour and a half, from the beginning to the end of the film, we stayed in a state of quiet transport in the darkness, her head resting on my shoulder the whole time. My shoulder became warm and damp from her breath. We came out of the movie theatre and strolled the twilight streets, my arms round her shoulder. We felt closer than ever before. The commotion of passers-by was comforting. Faint stars were shining through in the sky. Are we really in the right city, the two of us? she asked. I looked up at the sky. The pole star was in the right position, but somehow it looked like a fake pole star. Too big, too bright. Hmm, I wonder, I said. I feel like something's out of place, she said. That's what it's like coming to a new city. Your body can't quite get used to it. But after a while, you do get used to it, don't you? After two or three days, you'll be fine, I said. When we tired of walking, we went into the first restaurant we saw, drank some draft beer, and ordered some salmon and potatoes. We'd walked in willy-nilly off the street and gotten lucky. The beer really hit the spot, and the food was actually good. Well then, I said, after coffee, what say we settle on a place to stay? I've already got an image of a place, she said. Like what? Never mind, get a list of hotels and read off the names in order. I asked a waiter to bring over the yellow pages and started reading the names listed in the hotels inns section. After 40 names, she stopped me. That's the one. Which one? The last one you read. Dolphin Hotel, I said. That's where we're staying. Never heard of it. But I can't see us staying at any other hotel she replied. I returned the phone book, then called the Dolphin Hotel. A man with an indistinct voice answered, indicating they had double and single rooms available. And did they have other types of rooms, besides doubles and singles? No, doubles and singles were all. Confused, I reserved a double. The price, 40% less than what I'd expected. 
The Dolphin Hotel was located three blocks west and one block south of the movie theatre we'd gone to. A small place, totally undistinguished. Its undistinguishedness was metaphysical. No neon sign, no large signboard, not even a real entryway. The glass front door, which resembled an employee's kitchen entrance, had next to it only a copper plate engraved with Dolphin Hotel. Not even a picture of a dolphin. The building was five stories tall, but it might as well have been a giant matchbox stood on end. It wasn't particularly old. Still, it was strikingly run down. Most likely, it was run down when it was built. This was our dolphin hotel. Yet she, apparently, fell in love with the place the moment she set her eyes on it. Not a bad hotel, eh? she said. Not bad, I tossed back her words. Cozy, no frills. No frills, I repeated. By frills, I'm sure you mean clean sheets, or a sink that doesn't leak, or an air conditioner that works, or reasonably soft toilet paper, or fresh soap, or curtains that prevent sunstroke. You always look at the dark side of things, she laughed. Anyway, we didn't come here as tourists. On opening the door, I found the lobby bigger than expected. In the middle of it was a set of parlour furniture and a large colour TV. There was a quiz show on. Not a soul was in sight. Large potted ornaments sat on both sides of the front door, their leaves faded, nearly brown. I stood there, taking everything in. The lobby was actually a lot less spacious than it had initially seemed. It appeared large because there were so few pieces of furniture. The parlour set, a grandfather clock and a mirror, nothing else. I walked over and checked out the clock and the mirror. Both were commemorative presents of some event or another. The clock was seven minutes off. The mirror made my head crooked on my body. The parlour set was about as run down as the hotel itself. The carpet was an unappealing orange. The sort of orange you'd get by leaving a choicely sunburnt weaving out in the rain for a week, then throwing it into the cellar until it mildewed. This was an orange from the early days of Technicolor. On closer inspection, a balding middle-aged man lay, stretched out like a dried fish, asleep on the parlour set chez Long. At first I thought he was dead, but his nose twitched. There were the indentations of eyeglasses on the bridge of his nose, but no glasses anywhere, which would mean that he hadn't fallen asleep while watching television. It didn't make sense. I stood at the front desk and peeked over the counter. Nobody there. She rang the bell. It chimed across the expanse of lobby. We waited 30 seconds and got no response. The man on the chaise long didn't stir. She rang the bell again. Now, the man on the chaise long grunted. A self-accusing grunt. Then, he opened his eyes and looked us over vacantly. She gave the bell a third, serious ring. The man sprang up and dashed across the lobby. He edged by me and went behind the counter. He was a desk clerk. Terrible of me, he said. Really terrible of me. Fell asleep waiting for you. Sorry to wake you, I said. Not at all, said the desk clerk. He brought out a registration card and a ballpoint pen. He was missing the tips of the little and middle fingers on his left hand. I wrote my name on the card, but had second thoughts and crumpled it up and stuffed it in my pocket. I took another card and wrote a fake name and a fake address. An ordinary name and address, but not bad for a spur-of-the-moment name and address. I put down my occupation as real estate. The desk clerk picked up his thick, celluloid-rimmed glasses from behind the telephone and peered intently at the registration card. Suginami, Tokyo, 29 years old, a realtor. I took a tissue from my pocket and wiped the ink from my fingers. Here on business? asked the clerk. Uh, sort of, I said. How many nights? One month, I said. One month? 
He gave me a blank, white sheet of drawing paper look. You'll be staying here for one whole month? Is there something wrong with that? No, uh, nothing wrong, but, well, we like to settle up payment three days at a time. I set my satchel on the floor, counted out twenty, ten thousand yen notes, and lay them on the counter. There's more if that runs out, I said. The clerk scooped up the bills with the three fingers of his left hand and counted them with his right. Then he made out a receipt. Would there be anything special you might care to see in the way of a room? A corner room away from the elevator, if possible. The clerk turned around and squinted at the keyboard. After much ado, he chose room 406. The keyboard was almost entirely full. A real success story, the Dolphin Hotel. There was no such thing as a bellboy, so we carried our bags to the elevator. As she said, no frills. The elevator shook like a large dog with lung disease. For an extended stay, there's nothing like your small, basic hotel. Your small, basic hotel. Not a bad turn of phrase. Like something from the travel pages of a women's fashion magazine. After a long trip, your small, basic hotel is just the thing. Nonetheless, the first thing I did upon opening the door to our small, basic hotel room was to grab a slipper to smash a cockroach that was creeping along the window frame. Then... I picked up two pubic hairs lying by the foot of the bed and disposed of them in the trash. A new experience for me, seeing a cockroach in Hokkaido. Meanwhile, she ran the bath to temperature, and believe me, it was one noisy faucet. I tell you, we should have stayed in a better hotel. I opened the bathroom door and yelled in her direction. We've got more than enough money. It's not a question of money. Our sheep hunt begins here. No argument. It had to be here. I stretched out on the bed and smoked a cigarette, switched on the television and ran through all the channels. Then turned it off. The only thing decent was the reception. Presently, the bath water stopped and her clothes came flying out, followed by the sound of the hand shower. Parting the window curtains, I looked out across the way onto a sordid menagerie of buildings, every bit as incomprehensible as our dolphin hotel. Each one a dingy ash grey, and reeking of piss just by their looks. Although it was already nine o'clock, I could see people in the few lit windows, busily working away. I couldn't tell what line of work it was, but none of them looked terribly happy. Of course... To their eyes, I probably looked a bit forlorn too. I drew the curtains shut and returned to the bed, rolled over on the hard-as-asphalt starch sheets and thought about my ex-wife. I thought about the man she was living with now. I knew almost everything there was to know about him. He'd be my friend, after all. So why shouldn't I know? Twenty-seven years old. A not very well known jazz guitarist, but regular enough as not very well known jazz guitarists go. Not a bad guy. No style though. One year he'd drift between Kenny Burrell and B.B. King. Another year between Larry Coriel and Jim Hall. Why she'd up and choose him after me, I couldn't figure. Granted, you can pick out certain characteristics among individuals. Yet the only thing he had over me was that he could play guitar. And the only thing I had over him was that I could wash dishes. Most guitarists can't wash dishes. Ruin their fingers and there goes everything. Then I found myself thinking about sex with her. By default, I tried to calculate the number of times we'd had sex in our four years of married life. An approximate count at best, and admittedly, What would be the point of an approximate count? I should have kept a diary, or at least made some mark in a notebook. That way, I'd have an accurate figure. Accurate figures give things a sense of reality. My ex-wife kept precise records about sex. Not that she kept a diary, per se. She recorded in a notebook exact data about her periods from the first year on, and included sex as a supplementary reference. Altogether, there were eight of these notebooks, 
all kept in a locked drawer, together with important papers and photographs. These she showed to no one. That she kept records about sex is the full extent of my knowledge. What and how much she wrote, I have no idea. And now that we're no longer together, I'll probably never know. If I die, she told me once, burn these notebooks, douse them in kerosene and let them burn till ash, then bury them. I'd never forgive you if one word remained. But I'm the one who's been sleeping with you. I pretty much know every inch of your body. What's there to be ashamed of at this late date? Body cells replace themselves every month. Even at this very moment, she said, thrusting a skinny back of her hand before my eyes, most everything you think you know about me is nothing more than memories. The woman, save for the month or so prior to our divorce, was singularly methodical in her thinking. She had an absolutely realistic grasp on her life, which is to say that no door, once closed, ever opened again. Nor, as a rule, was any door left wide open. Now, all I know about her is my memories of her, and these memories fade further and further into the distance, like displaced cells. Was it all biology? Chapter 26. Enter the Sheep Professor. We woke the next morning at eight, donned our clothes, headed down in the elevator and out to a nearby coffee shop for breakfast. No, the Dolphin Hotel had no coffee shop. Like I said yesterday, we'll split up, I said, passing her a copy of the sheep photo. I'll use the mountains in the background as a handle towards searching out the place. You'll research places where they raise sheep. You know what to do. Any clue, anything, it doesn't matter how small, is fine. Anything is an improvement over scouring the entire island of Hokkaido, totally blind. I'm fine, leave it up to me. Okay, let's meet back at the hotel in the evening. Don't worry so much, she said, putting on sunglasses. Finding it's going to be a piece of cake. Of course, it was no piece of cake. Things never happen that well. I went to the Territorial Tourist Agency, did the rounds of various tourist information centres and travel agents, inquired at the Mountaineering Association. In general, I checked all the places that had anything to do with tourism and mountains. Nobody could recall ever having seen the mountains in the photograph. They're such ordinary looking mountains too, they all said. Besides, the photo shows only a small part of them. One whole day on the pavement, and that was about as close to progress as I got. That is, the realisation that it would be difficult to identify mountains with nothing to distinguish them, and with only a partial view of them. I stopped into a bookstore and bought the Mountains of Hokkaido and the Hokkaido Atlas, then went into a cafe, had two ginger ales, and skimmed through my purchases. As far as mountains were concerned, there was an unbelievable number in Hokkaido, all of them about the same in colour and in shape. I tried comparing the mountains in the rat's photograph with every mountain in the book. After ten minutes, I was dizzy. It was no comfort to learn that the number of mountains in the book represented but a tiny fraction of all the mountains in Hokkaido. Complicated by the fact that a mountain viewed from one angle gave a wholly different impression than from another angle. Mountains are living things, wrote the author in his preface to the book. Mountains, according to the angle of view, the season, the time of day, the beholder's frame of mind, or any one thing, can effectively change their appearance. Thus, it is essential to recognise that we can never know more than one side, one small aspect of a mountain. Just great, I said out loud, an impossible task. At the five o'clock bell, I went out to sit on a park bench and eat corn with the pigeons. Her efforts at information gathering fared better than mine, but ultimately they were futile too. We compared notes of the day's trials and tribulations over a modest dinner at a restaurant behind the Dolphin Hotel. The livestock section of the territorial government knew next to nothing, she said. They've stopped keeping track of sheep. It doesn't pay to raise sheep. 
at least not by large-scale ranching or free-range grazing. In a way, that makes the search easier, I said. Not really. Ranchers still raise sheep quite actively and even have their own union, which the authorities keep tabs on. With middle and small-scale sheep raising, however, it's difficult to keep any accurate count going. Everyone keeps a few sheep pretty much like they do cats and dogs. For what it's worth, I took down the addresses of the 30 sheep raisers they had listings for. But the papers were four years old, and people move around a lot in four years. Japan's agricultural policies change every three years, just like that, you know? Ah, <sighs> Just great. I sighed into my beer. Seems like we've come to a dead end. There must be more than a hundred similar mountains in Hokkaido, and the state of sheep raising is a total blank. This is the first day. We've only just begun. Haven't those ears of yours gotten the message yet? No message for the time being, she said, eating her simmered fish and miso soup. That much I know. I only get despairing messages when I'm confused or feeling some mental pinch. But that's not the case now. The lifeline only comes when you're on the verge of drowning. Right. For the moment, I'm satisfied to be going through all this with you. And as long as I'm satisfied, I get no such message. So, it's up to us to find that sheep on our own. I don't know, I said. In a sense, if we don't find that sheep, we'll be up to our necks in it. In what I can't say, but if those guys say they're going to get us, they're going to get us. They're pros. No matter if the boss dies, the organisation will remain and their network extends everywhere in Japan. Like the sewers. They'll have our necks. Dumb as it sounds, that's the way it is. Sounds like the invaders, she said. Ridiculous, I know, but the fact is we've gotten ourselves stuck in the middle of it, and by ourselves, I mean you and me. At the start it was only me, but by now you're in the picture too. Still feel like you're not on the verge of drowning? Hey, this is just the sort of thing I love. Let me tell you, it's more fun than sleeping with strangers, or flashing my ears, or proofreading biographical dictionaries. This is living! Which is to say, I interjected, we're not drowning so we have no rope. Right, it's up to us to find that sheep. Neither you nor I have left so much behind really. Maybe not. We returned to the hotel and had intercourse. I like that word, intercourse. It poses only a limited range of possibilities. Our third and fourth days in Sapporo came and went for naught. We'd get up at eight, have breakfast, split up for the day, and when evening came, we'd exchange information over supper, return to the hotel, have intercourse, and sleep. I threw away my old tennis shoes, bought new sneakers, and went around showing the photograph to hundreds of people. She made up a long list of sheep raisers based on sources from the government offices and the library, and started phoning every one of them. The results were nil. Nobody could place the mountain, and no sheep raiser had any recollection of a sheep with a star on its back. One old man said he remembered seeing that mountain in southern Sakhalin before the war. I wasn't about to believe that the rat had gone to Sakhalin. No way can you send a letter special delivery from Sakhalin to Tokyo. Gradually, I was getting worn down. My sense of direction had evaporated by our fourth day. When south became opposite east, I bought a compass, but going around with a compass only made the city seem less and less real. The buildings began to look like backdrops in a photography studio, the people walking the streets like cardboard cutouts. The sun rose from one side of a featureless land, shot up a cannonball arc across the sky, then set on the other side. The fifth, then the sixth day passed. October laid heavy on the town. The sun was warm enough, but the wind grew brisk, and by late in the day, I'd have to put on a thin cotton windbreaker. The streets of Sapporo were wide and depressingly straight. Up until then, I'd had no idea how much walking around in a city of nothing but straight lines can tire you out. 
I drank seven cups of coffee a day, took a leak every other hour, and slowly lost my appetite. Why don't you put an ad in the papers? She proposed. You know, friends want to get in touch with you or something. That's not a bad idea, I said. It didn't matter if we came up empty-handed. It had to be doing nothing. So I placed a three-line notice in the morning editions of four newspapers for the following day. Attention, rat. Get in touch. Urgent. Dolphin Hotel, room 406. For the next two days, I waited by the phone. The day of the ad, there were three calls. One was a call from a local citizen. What's this rat? Uh, It's the nickname of a friend, I answered. He hung up, satisfied. Another was a prank call. Squeak, squeak, came a voice from the other end of the line. Squeak, squeak. I hung up. Cities are damn strange places. The third was from a woman with a reedy voice. Everybody always calls me rat, she said. A voice in which you could almost hear the telephone lines swaying in the distant breeze. Thank you for taking the trouble to call. However, the rat I'm looking for is a man, I explained. I kind of thought so, she said. But in any case, since I'm a rat too, I thought I may as well give you a call. Really, thank you very much. Not at all. Have you found your friend? Uh, Not yet, I said, unfortunately. If only it had been me you were looking for. But no, it wasn't me. That's the way it goes. Sorry. She fell silent. Meanwhile, I scratched my nose with my little finger. Really, I just wanted to talk to you. She came back. With me? I don't quite know how to put it, but I fought the urge ever since I came across your ad in the morning paper. I didn't mean to bother you. So, all that about you being called Rat was a made-up story. That's right, she said. Nobody ever calls me Rat. I don't even have any friends. That's why I wanted to call you so badly. I heaved a sigh. Well, um, thanks, anyway. Forgive me, are you from Hokkaido? I'm from Tokyo, I said. Then you're up here looking for a friend who's also from Tokyo. That's correct. How old is his friend? He's just turned 30. And you? About the same. Single? Yes. I'm 22. I suppose things get better as time goes on. Well, I said, who knows? Some things get better, some don't. It'd be nice if we could get together and discuss things over dinner. Um, you'll have to excuse me, but I've got to stay here and wait for a call. Oh, yes, she said. Sorry about everything. Anyway, thanks for calling. I hung up. Clever, very clever. A call girl, maybe, looking for some business. True, she might really have been just a lonely girl. Either way, it was the same. I still had zero leads.